plenty of time, right? <laughs> I'll do anything, just not have to listen to Matt Yarnold talk. Oh, I just, no, I appreciate the uh, opportunity for us to talk. I, I love this uh, meeting every single year, but I want to give an update on some of the projects that we have going on. Um, uh, a lot of faculty are on projects. We tend to collaborate a lot. So Mike Engelhart's here, Eric Williamson, Matt Hebden, they're all on this and some of our stuff even we've got some we cross lines where we both A&M, &M, right? So, uh, but a lot of a lot of important contributions uh, actually to this. Um, and as a general outline, we've got tons of work going on, fortunately, actually at, uh, at UT lately. So I could talk about all of these. Instead, I'm going to focus just on a couple here. Um, development of non fracture critical steel straddle caps, which is kind of a fun study we've been working with. And then another one, the use of large diameter shear studs. I should mention, though, that a lot of tech stock sponsored research. Um, we we're expecting quite a bit to actually to come into AASHTO in the next uh, uh, next uh, edition. Um, some of those just kind of we got uh, NCHR RP 12-113. Well, that's not a tech stock project. Actually, uh, Jamie and Ken Lin and so on from tech stock had a huge impact on this by letting us find bridges and so on to, in to instrument. And there's a lot of work actually coming from that. Um, several sections of AASHTO actually been modified, some new sections actually added. Um, we've got some other things, uh, studies on lateral tours and buckling non-prismatic sections. It's a new C sub B expression. There's actually two different methods, the UT method, which is the preferred method for everybody, and then the Georgia Tech method. Uh, Don White taking it, but they're going to be back in the appendix. And anyway, I, it gives you a lot of options, you know, to actually do. Um, some other work, uh, we had a project about 10 years ago, I think, looking at bent plate, plates, and we actually came up with the uh, thing. Carl Frank had a huge impact on this too, about split pipe stiffeners. They're actually now going to be in AASHTO, so it gives you a lot of options and things you can do with heavily skewed systems. Another project improved uh, details for tub girders. There's lots of upcoming uh, ballots actually on that one. And then finally, we had another one looking at uh, reinforcing steel um, in the slabs over negative moment regions and really the use of PCPs. That's another upcoming ballot. So a lot of potential for you know textile projects to really have a very substantial impact on the next uh, edition of AASHTO. So some neat things kind of going in there. Um, but I want to start with this project. We've got a development of non-fracture critical steel uh, box rattle caps. Uh, we've had an army on this project. Uh, I'll underline uh, um, is there a laser pointer on this one. That's not the one I wanted to hit. So anyway, there we go. Uh, Esteban Zetchin, who's a PhD student, who's going to be finishing this project up, um, really done some neat stuff on here, and we can kind of see some of the the tests and so on that we've kind of been doing with this. Um, the goal of this is to really kind of obviously try to get to non-fracture critical systems. And addition, in addition to the people that have been working specifically on the research, we've had a lot of guidance. Many people within Textile, a lot of people that are here have had really had a huge impact. Jamie's on this, Tom Fan. Um, David Fish is on it, lots, lots of people. So if I'm missing your name, at least it's listed there. Um, this, on both the projects I'm going to talk about today, we've, we've done something different on these last ones, which we've gotten a little bit smarter and realized that we come up sometimes with ideas and we get out at the end and find out that's not really practical or there's some aspects we could change. So we have an industry advisory group. It's got Dennis Normberg. I don't know if Dennis is here, Carl's on it. Um, Know, Ronnie and so on, but really played a huge role in kind of letting us come up with ideas and so on that really are viable from a fabrication standpoint, a construction standpoint, and so on. So they've had a real big impact actually on the project. Um, uh, as I, you know, we're all kind of aware in here what straddle caps are, so I'm not going to dwell on this. This is a picture of one up at 290 and, and uh, I-35. We're really looking at trying to take those box straddle caps and try to get to something that's a non-fracture critical system um, to try to improve, first of all, the design, but really the long-term behavior and inspection requirements for that. Um, a lot of guidance actually that's present that you can do now with regards to designing for fracture critical members. Uh, I think actually the term fracture critical is probably going to be going by the wayside soon, so I don't know what I'm going to do in the titles of some of these things, but lots of documents, whether we're talking about just AASHTO, but uh, Rob Connor at Purdue um, did a lot of work really in, in developing some uh, guidance and guide specifications on how to design for fracture critical members. TxDOT's been doing a lot of neat stuff over the last few years, developing methods as well. Um, really, we've got the redundancy one, redundancy two, and then we have an extreme event three with TxDOT that really are what we have to do if we have a 
a fracture that would occur in the section about what we want to see the, the system be able to withstand. So um, we've got these different redundancy loads that we have to be able to sustain uh, on, on the girders in the failed state. Um, some of the different design concepts, we've really come up with two different design concepts actually on this study. We'll call it design concept A and design concept B. Um, a is primarily for retrofitting systems, but if I have my straddle cap uh, type system here, um, one of the ideas we had was to incorporate like Dowdag bars, PT bars, but they're not they're not tension, but they're mainly a passive reinforcement, such that if we were to have a defect that is essentially fractured through our cross section, it would engage those bars and then they would provide redundancy around that fractured system there. So that was one of the ideas that we had. Um, another one that we came up with the team that uh, is more for like new uh, construction is to use a, a con essentially a conventional welded section with the exception that the bottom flange here, we would use a bolted flange where we've got these flange connection plates that extend out uh, such that again, if we end up having a defect that then goes through and fractures, um, we have a cross boundary separation to where the crack's not going to jump up into the rest of the cross section. Um, so we actually took both of these into uh, specimens from a, a design or a testing perspective. So in the laboratory, these were the sections that we had. We have two reusable end segments um, that we end up having. Um, these were actually fabricated for us by APCO. And uh, really what we did is we have these reusable end segments and then this middle test specimen in here that could be reused. So it allows us to get a little bit more efficiency. Had a span of about 60 feet on here. And then we're applying uh, loads at the locations here of the closed loop system and trying to take this up to fracture. So this is a schematic of what the setup looks like uh, on, on the system. And this is what it actually looks like. So they're about five foot deep, 40 inches wide, very close to realistic dimensions that you would actually find uh, in the field, maybe on the shorter uh, side of what you have, but still it is realistic um, type system. But as you can see in here are reusable end segments here and then um, the test specimen that we have uh, in the middle. Okay? Um, so that's what we call an expendable test segment where we had uh, a couple of different uh, sections fabricated that you're using some of those different details that we have. Um, here the, this is in, actually in the site. You can kind of see where the actuators are here where they're applying the load and again where our specimen uh, is on the section. The details we specifically used for uh, specimen A, that's a design concept A, was to use those uh, Dowdag bars here. Um, important aspect we found is kind of splicing them and so on using shorter ones so you got a little more stiffness out of, of your section there. Um, we ended up having a, a W12 by 90 that we coped away the flanges just to try to make sure we distributed those loads out to the edge of the section at the diaphragm locations uh, on our section. And then we've got uh, essentially our uh, a passive reinforcement that gets engaged if uh, we were to fracture um, our system and then it sends those loads to the uh, Cope W sections, which take it out into uh, get the forces back into the cross section. Um, to save ourselves from having to have another specimen fabricated, we said, hey, let's just take uh, the specimen for design concept A and just flip it upside down and then we have a conventional box. So we want to at least establish what the existing details could actually do. So we just flipped it upside down so now this is our tension flange and there's no real redundancy um, that we're providing there and we could end up taking and, and do a baseline test on our section. Um, we also had two specimens using design concept B. The only real difference on these is really the size of our flange connection plate. First ones were nine by one inch uh, wide here um, on that section. And, uh, and then we have our plate on the bottom here that uh, is a bolted plate that uh, we're going to introduce our, our fracture into and look at that behavior. So engaging the bolts uh, on our section. We had another section of B2 that essentially the big difference there. Again, it's just a bigger plate. Try to look at what we would do. We would um, have from a behavioral standpoint if we're using a little bit larger plate um, section on there. Um, the, the testing protocol we used is very similar to what uh, was developed actually at Purdue with Rob Connor. Um, that he did a lot of work actually looking at uh, cross boundary separation and stuff on built up eye girders and things like that. Where really what we end up doing is we introduce a defect into the system by notching um, that section. So taking a grinder and cutting in a specific defect into the cross section there for notching it. We then would su subject it to cyclic loading and uh, you know, try to grow that defect into a sharp crack that would be simulating a fatigue crack. We then cool the specimen down using liquid nitrogen and then 
quickly load the specimen and induce that fracture. After we kind of do that, we want to see what the ultimate strength of the system is. Then we do a post fracture test here where we take and load that section up. We did that both loading at room temperature where we would have more ductile material, but also loading it up to the uh, at the colder temperature just to make sure you know, we don't get some different behavior on our section. Um, generally, the fracture test was done using the, the closed loop hydraulic system. We're getting the much larger loads on these ultimate strength tests. So there we were loading them more statically after in, in essentially would be like in the failed state and then loading it up to ultimate uh, um, with that section. So we get to a higher pressure there, which gives us you know, essentially up to 800 kips per actuator that we're using on that. It is a slower loading, but again, we're um, generally getting into the thing. So just a video, hopefully this. Uh, if I can get it to work. OK, good. So you can kind of see where we've got the liquid nitrogen coming in here. Kind of watch the back wall. You can end up kind of seeing the, the deflection, how fast it's being applied, the load. Um, yeah. I wish uh, we had sound, but we don't. So not much we can do about that. Um, this actually was what we're showing here was the, the loading for design concept B, which had just that bottom plate. We actually did this for all the different sections, starting with a baseline specimen, then going to the, the case with the dollar dag bars, and then finally, um, going to uh, the cases with section B1 and B2. I guess for some reason it wants to go back through that one. So there we go. Now for all the different specimens, you can kind of look at the fracture surface that we ended up having on this. So this is um, showing post fracture when we've loaded this up. And what we've essentially done is taken the cross section and really folded out the webs uh, on our section here. So what you're looking at here is the bottom flange, and then this would just be the projection of just the east web and the west web. We start out this again by grinding in defects on either side. We grow it to a fatigue um, a sharp crack and then uh, you know, uh, load it up then to, to get that, that uh, fracture to actually happen. So uh, that was the baseline specimen, I guess, that uh, I was showing there. Um, we look at what happened with uh, the section with the Dawa dags. Um, they did. A, they actually did stop the, the crack from propagating as we did this and we loaded it up to ultimate. So the fracture surface we got that, the, you know, once we loaded up to ultimate again, here are the defects that we're showing here and then um, we loaded that up and you can kind of see how it fits. And the bottom flange is actually those cracks tended to bifurcate on most of the specimens that we ended up doing. Um, should mention we were getting the temperatures down between minus 200 to minus 300 degrees Fahrenheit. So nice and cool. So it uh, was well into the uh, lower shelf fracture temperatures uh, on these sections. And then um, for specimen B1 and B2, as anticipated, in this case, we ended up cutting a groove out to the first bolt and then uh, you know, grinding the defect and then growing it. But the fractures, as we expected, only went across the bottom flange for both specimens B1, and then we had a similar behavior out of specimen B2. Um, when we look at uh, the, the load versus deformation behavior of the different specimens, so we're looking at a graph here of the moment at the fracture location versus the deflection at the crack. This is the baseline specimen where this one, the very first test we did, we didn't want to actually risk losing that specimen, so we actually just used the uh, um, uh, static, the, the, the slower loading system on that. We did load up the crack propagated and then it propagated again. And then we got to the point where we said we don't want to waste this. We needed to fix it and flip it over and use it for, for our specimen A. Um, specimen A, if we look at that, the behavior, this is the Dawa Dag bars. Um, it did come up and, you know, as I mentioned, it arrested the crack. Um, you can kind of see after the crack happens, the load drops off a little bit, then it catches right back up within like a second or two, and then it goes up and it arrested that crack. What we did on that then is we unloaded it and then we uh, uh, loaded it up using more of the static system. So it reloads. Once we got up to this point, just a little bit above where the crack had arrested, the crack did extend further. And um, then as we continued to load this up, as we continued to load this up, it ended up uh, going to this point and then that was our ultimate capacity that we ended up having um, for that section. For uh, section B1, I don't actually have the curve for B2, but it's similar, but it actually had a little bit higher capacity than we had here. Um, when we loaded that up, I should say this was the, the, the case where the crack propagated through that bottom, bolted bottom flange, and obviously it did move into the rest of the cross section. When we then took it up to the ultimate, you can kind of see the curves that we ended up getting very good behavior actually out of that specimen B1. Um, just to get a feel for the redundancy loads, 
our design concept A didn't make it up to the redundancy load level. It doesn't mean though that we couldn't make that happen. It's just we didn't have enough pre-stressing in there to get to it. Right now we're working at it computationally to see how much more we would have to have and trying to simulate that. But uh, both design, uh, both specimens B1 and B2 for design concept B made it up to the redundancy level load. B2 actually even made it higher than this. So uh, we're gonna see, I think that's a design concept that I would say right now you can apply. And we're, this project ends in the spring. Um, so we feel like this is gonna be something actually we can go when we have a non-fracture critical option essentially for that using that design concept. We are in the process right now of doing some extensive parametric studies. We're validating the model and then we're using pretty much the wide range of, of geometries that we can expect out of straddle caps um, um, the, here in, in, in Texas and actually around the US on that. So um, we anticipate this will be done, uh, as I said, around the, the end of the spring on our section. So this kind of concluding remarks, as I kind of mentioned, we're still looking at this design concept A to kind of see how on, impractical, might, how much, you know, uh, PT bars do you actually need to get to where you can get to that redundancy load level? We think you can make it happen. We just have to see how practical it is. The other design concept, it behaved you know, very, very nice. So it was not a real problem at all with that. Um, feedback we got from AFCO and, and Ronnie's provided a lot of information that actually the, the make these is not really any more difficult than actually making the conventional welded uh, box that we, we end up having. So a lot of promise we think actually for that other design concept. Um, I also want to talk then about a project that we have going on looking at using larger diameter shear studs for composite girders. Uh, Mike Englehart actually is the PI on this project, a lot of the usual suspects. We have three PhD students that have been working on this and did some really nice, uh, nice work. Much like uh, before, we had a lot of help out of uh, TechSot um, and guidance kind of on this project. And then we're also using an, an advisory group. Um, a lot of the same people. John Holt is actually on this one. I don't think he was on the previous one. We also have a guy named Clark Champney, who's kind of a, a stud expert from Nelson. Um, I think he was probably there when they started. <laughs> he's an older guy, but he's seen everything and, and provide a lot of guidance on what actually can be done. And then also on both these, Randy Rogers from Williams Brothers in Houston has, has provided a lot of um, help and guidance on what, what he sees from the construction side of it. Um, so you know, most of the common uh, shear studs you're using in your everyday design is, is seven eighths inch diameter studs. The number of studs are often controlled by fatigue. We do have some changes coming, so that may change a little bit, but they're usually governed by fatigue. But you often end up getting kind of a sea of studs actually on uh, the system. The whole question line, we never really see shear studs fail by fatigue and all this stuff, but so what we're doing may be very, very conservative. So the idea might be to go to larger diameter studs and try to reduce, because during construction, when you have iron workers and so on up here, it's just walking on that flange, it's a safety hazard uh, for the most part. So if we can do fewer studs, it'll improve the safety. Here in Texas, another reason why we want to use it is TxDOT really wants to use the PCPs on these systems. And if you have so many studs, it's hard to actually fit them on those flanges. So if I can use fewer studs, we can end up having an easier time fitting the PCPs actually on that, that system. So we looked at the feasibility of using a one and an eighth inch diameter and one and a quarter inch diameter studs. Um, evaluating the static and fatigue strength of, of those larger studs is also a goal uh, of this project. <coughs> um, probably haven't seen a one and a quarter inch diameter stud before, but this is what it looks like relative to a seven eighths inch diameter. It is a really big shear stud. Um, and looking at this, we started off doing lots and lots of welding tests on this. And we just decided we're going to focus on one and eighth inch diameter studs just because they were easier to weld and uh, easier to actually do bend tests. Um, it was like the students are out there with a sledgehammer trying to get the, the things to bend. It's a it's a workout. You can kind of get rid of your gym membership, I think, to actually do that. But a lot of aspects on this study. I'm going to focus really on these uh, uh, tasks six and seven, which are push out tests as well as some large beam tests that we're doing. And currently we're doing a lot of FEA studies actually also on this. Um, I'd mentioned that, uh, you know, one and an eighth is what we're actually targeting on this uh, for our behavior on the system. Um, um, the push out test, the objectives are to look at the static strength as well as trying to get it to see how these larger diameter studs behave from a fatigue perspective. And then also look at the, the existing and the newly proposed ASTO equations, uh, how, how well they predict the behavior from a fatigue standpoint. Um, this just shows, uh, you know, our, our typical push out test. If you've never seen this, what we're doing here is we cast two different slabs. This would simulate really two bridges. It's mainly to get symmetry 
uh, in our specimen. And then what we're doing on the test, typically, when we look at this, we've got our steel section, which simulates the, uh, the girder. And then, you know, we've got our shear studs and the reinforcing cage that we end up having up in the deck on uh, a system. And then what we're typically doing then is in this test, is we have a couple of actuators up here. We're pushing on the steel section and really just kind of looking at the ultimate strength is it allows us to really get in and, and look at the different details and how they behave, kind of simulating more what you would have out maybe in the middle of a positive moment region. Um, I'd like to have the sound on. The students have a funny sense of humor, actually. There's nice, neat music in the back of it, but you can't see. But you can see all the different tests that we ended up doing. The failures typically are pretty quick. I mean, you're getting usually a, a pretty you know quick failure on, on our system here. Um, the actuators actually fell off. So it's usually a pretty good release of energy when these things actually um, fracture. We've done lots and lots of tests actually uh, on these specimens to look at the behavior. Um, some of the different uh, uh, details, this just actually shows how we're casting and we typically cast them in the horizontal position just to make sure we're getting concrete that would be of the same consistency you're going to get on a bridge deck. If you do them vertically, you, you start to get some bleed water and variation and properties through the, along the length. So we do them in a horizontal position, um, you know, putting the, the reed bar and, and so on in there. And then you take the two halves of the section and bolt them together uh, to get your full test specimen. Um, another aspect we're doing on here is we're doing, we've been doing some checks on using PCPs, uh, details that we end up having. You can kind of see here where the PCPs are over like a region over here. And then we have like a cast in place um, section uh, in the middle there. Um, some of the different details we're looking at, a standard cast in place specimen uh, is shown here. Um, a standard PCP specimen has some small simulated PCPs on either side. And then we have a closure or a cast in place region that kind of simulates the details that's going to happen actually in the bridge that we end up having there. Um, again, we're using one and an eighth inch diameter studs. We're also doing some where we've been doing tests at like seven eighths inch diameter, just so we know what the existing specimens would have versus what uh, the newer specimens uh, the big with the bigger shear studs would end up having. Um, you know, we, we're we're looking at different details using say two one and eighth uh, inch diameter shear studs per row. Um, we're also looking at cases where um, we have like a one inch haunch, and then cases where we're using a little bit larger haunches also on there, just to look at the penetration of the um, uh, shear stud into the rebar. So. But a lot of our tests were done with seven inch liner studs to kind of get to some of these where we had like a three inch haunch. We're using a five inch stud just to look at the impact of the different penetration into the deck uh, on our section there. And then as I mentioned, we're also testing cases with the PCPs. Here we're looking at a couple different cases where we're using a single line of studs. And then another one we're looking at is using more of a staggered line where you kind of offset them a little bit. You kind of zigzag down the length. Um, trying to get it to where the failure plane wouldn't be in one line, but maybe spreading them out and getting a little bit more concrete in between the, the shear studs that we end up having there. These just show some typical uh, uh, load versus deformation behavior that we're getting for the different regions. Um, you can see where a 7 8 inch diameter stud would be right here. And then some of the other ones we're looking at using is with uh, you know one stud per row, two studs per, uh, uh, two studs per row, and then also one here where we're kind of getting the, the zigzag specimen. We did get to a higher capacity um, with the single row of studs, but it didn't quite have the ductility that we have with the um, uh, staggered layout of the studs. So typically on that, we actually think that that actually has a, a really good potential to kind of give us both adequate strength and ductility uh, on that specimen. Okay. Um, I should mention, we also have been doing the tests on the PCPs. We're getting a different failure mode typically with the PCPs. A lot of the times with, with uh, the cast in place decks, we're getting essentially shearing of the stud, but uh, it's more of a concrete failure when we're using the PCP. So we're looking a little bit more at that um, just to try to look at the difference in behavior and so on uh, on those specimens. I mentioned that we're also doing fatigue on these. These are actually showing the behavior of our specimens, which are shown with the, the larger axis here versus all the other different um, things we were finding in the literature for seven eighths inch diameter specimens and, and some of the other things. So, Fatigue performance of these are actually really good. This is using the existing Ashto limit. If we look at uh, the, the, the newly proposed or, or validated thing, that actually it also behaves very, very well. So we're finding with these larger diameter studs, there's no issue with fatigue. They actually behave very, very well, um, better than what we've even seen in some of the seven eighths inch diameter um, studs. Um, the push out test, kind of then the summary that we end up having is that uh, overall with the one and eighth inch 
excellent behavior we've kind of seen from an overall strength standpoint. Um, results are uh, what we have in AASHTO are tend to be um, conservative from a fatigue perspective, and the prediction is actually you know pretty good on predicting even the static strength of them. So we're seeing good agreement in that. Um, the one eighth inch diameter, we're not seeing like a lot of large cracking or anything, or anything different in our push out test. We are going to, as I'll show in a second, doing some additional tests to try to get the behavior in actual beam type consideration. We are recommending that you get a little bit larger penetration into that slab up to four inches into the deck. It's preferred for the larger diameter studs. And again, we're still looking at the PCP results. It's a little bit different failure, as I said, it's more of a splitting of the concrete versus what we were getting out of the shear stud failure that we had for most of our cast and place options. Um, in the fatigue perspective, these things behave really, really good. There's no concerns about fatigue for the larger diameter um, studs that we have. Um, large scale beam tests, this is kind of the final things. And we actually got a one year extension on this and in, in talking with the monitoring committee from TxDOT, we wanted to really see the behavior a little bit more in, in an actual beam application. So what we want to do is here to try to understand more in a beam application with the larger diameter studs. I said there's really no cracking issues we saw in the push out test. We want to make sure in an actual condition that you're not going to see some serviceability issues with those those larger systems. So trying to look a little bit at what we're going to get for the, the deck cracking on there, but also look a little bit at the behavior and overall beam. We're going to do two different specimens, one using a fully cast in place slab. That would be like analogous if you're using permanent metal deck forms, which a lot of times are using steel systems versus using the PCPs uh, on the, the system there. We have a 100 foot long um, uh, steel girder um, that we're having on here, and we're going to do two different uh, setups for each specimen. Um, one is going to be looking at more of like the negative moment region. So 60 feet from one end, 40 feet from the other is we're putting a support. We didn't want to put it right in the middle and then have it damage the concrete that we're going to load it up when we load it up in the next setup where we close with uh, failure in the positive moment region. But we'll do some tests here with loads in each side just to kind of look at the deck crack and kind of get around the negative moment region uh, on there. And then we remove that support and then take it up to failure more as a simply supported system, looking at kind of what happens out near the maximum positive moment region of our system there. Um, specimen one, as I mentioned, is a fully cast in place deck, eight and a half inches thick. Um, specimen two is using the four inch thick PCPs with a ca uh, you know, cast in place region of the slab uh, on there. Um, say, Time and whatever we decided instead of going look at a built up section, we're going to use W14 by 199 sections. These just show the different details we're looking at with the cast and place option versus using the PCPs here. Um, this just kind of shows some different pictures of where we're at um, in our supports. We're putting load cells under each support region just so that we look at the results at the end. We actually have a statics can add up and make sure that we can understand how the force is actually getting through. Um, our system there. Um, this actually shows where we've got the form work, where we have some plywood forms in here, and we uh, haven't put the shear studs in there yet. Um, then we came in and you can see we're doing the shear studs. So I should talk really about the staggered layout. That's what the staggered layout essentially looks like. Um, we are partnering, uh, Matt Hebden and, and Gary uh, um, Prince from uh, Arkansas currently are on an NCHRP study to try to understand a little bit more about shear studs. So what we're doing some of these is actually using some uh, gauges that we're putting actually on some of the different studs to kind of help understand a little bit about force transfer through some of the different studs on there. We did some bend tests just to make sure we have good quality weld, welds out near mid span uh, of the section. So just to make sure that we were getting good welds. This actually shows you can kind of see the wiring and stuff for some of those gauges I was talking about that are actually on the shear studs. We've got our uh, reinforcing steel here, and then our students get the wonderful experience of being able to get up and actually cast the slab and finish it. So um, it actually, you know, uh, looks pretty good here. You can kind of see the finish, the, uh, with the form work still in there. Where we're at right now is uh, we've, you know, fully removed all the form work. We're letting the deck cure, and then we'll be starting the testing status on that. Just real quickly to show where we're at again, this is another picture kind of shows the overall specimen here and just what you couldn't see if you went out to the laboratory right now. Um, we are doing a lot of FBA results using the Texas Advanced Computing Center, um, doing FBA results really to try to take some of the results from the push out tests. We validating our model and then trying to understand a little bit better about how the systems work, both with PCPs and using a fully cast in place lab. Um, anyway. Spent a lot of time, first of all, validating the models, and now we're actually getting in and really understanding more of the ultimate strength of some of these. 
we compared lots of experiments with our things, and generally we're getting very nice mimicking of the curve of our FEA versus the experiments. We're usually within six percent or so of all of the results that we've actually looked at. So anyway, uh, 1143. So uh, be happy if there's time to answer any questions if you have it. If you ask me difficult questions, I'll defer to Mike and let him have it. <laughs> Okay, hey, uh, um, I might have missed it, but that's more like savings. Well, now when you look at uh, when we go to like the larger studs, I want, I want to say it's forty percent less for the one and an A. If you're going one and a quarter, like fifty percent less, because the area goes up really, really quickly. And you know, we we did have uh, Nelson specifically made these for us, like a one and a quarter inch, which was you know pretty impressive. But the main issue we had there was just getting good quality wells that that high and man to bend the things it's just crazy um, that's something we have to have you think about is how someone's going to do a bend test on this like maybe they can put a hydraulic apparatus that you take and actually bend it more it sums out to a sledgehammer kind of thing but yeah you you can eliminate like 40 percent of those but the nice thing here too is that using pcps right now with seven eighths inch diameter it, it's really tough because you take a 16, 18 inch wide flange and put three shear studs per location. Also, you don't have enough room to actually get them in there. So that's why, like using, you know, the staggered layouts and you're able to scoot them way in. You can a lot more use of those. But also, from a safety standpoint, you know, it's easier for an iron worker to walk with fewer studs. So you're not compromising the, the composite strength that you're making a little bit easier from that perspective. And the, the link to weld them is the same exact link. So it's it, it, all around, I just think they're more efficient. And going in the parametric study, are you going to look at this? Not, not, we're just looking at traditional um, ones, but you know, that'd be a neat project next to do. And there have been some studies, I think, done on that. Mike, I don't know if you have any other comments on the pockets, but we aren't looking at that. But, right, no. but, but what's that? Okay. Good. Yeah. I'm just curious. You said Nelson had to make those big studs. Did they make a, a new gun for it? You know, they shot them with some guns. No, we actually we have got the the. Well, it's it's what is it like? It's the Nell Well. Nell Well six thousand. Six thousand. Yeah. They haven't made a custom. Okay. I'm just curious. Just yeah, commercial equipment. Yeah, well, I mean, what about the insulator and everything? Those pictures made? Right, yeah. Yeah, the barrels, whatever, have to be But other than that, like, there was nothing special with the equipment for the most part. What we had will actually do that. And well, our students, we became experts in, in welding these days. And that's where we got a lot of feedback, actually, from, from Ideal and Birchfeld or, or APCO on some of this. But it's some of it's kind of, you got to loop the, the cord around the stud and all kinds of neat things. We were always having jokes and one goes down the end of the water. <laughs> you know, you really have to, you know, the students have to just be experts on this and just got to work. They're just doing fantastic, you know, well, getting little failures and stuff. But yeah. I have another question, Bob. Uh, on the filter. Yeah. Maybe maybe more a question for Jamie and Texan in general, but. You end up with basically two concepts, the post tension concept and the concept. On the plan, it looks like probably would be more like an inclined approach. And then the other one is still intended to use for the work like pressure. Exactly. That, that's kind of what our intent would be is that the PT bar, and I don't like to call them PT bars because we're not stressing them. We, you know, when you get their passive until you get a defect and so on. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, even though like we didn't get up to the, the level that we wanted for the, the redundancy load, we can make it work. It's just you got to make sure, you know, if we were using uh, one and a quarter inch diameter bars and they go up to two inches or whatever, you can use bigger bars and much like the shear studs, the capacity goes up in a hurry. So we can actually get them to work. We just have to kind of see it and then work with XOD and our industry. Is it practical and, and how would we actually do this? Um, the bolted bottom flange, as I said, APCO would say, it's just very similar to what we are currently doing. Um, so it's, I mean, that one's just ready for prime time. You can actually, and what the design philosophy or design approach is, you got a redundancy load you got to carry. So you're going to go through and you essentially size your 
the weld section with the flange uh, connection plates. That would put you with size then to support the redundancy load. And then the strength one load combination would be the full box with that bottom flange. But it just, it, you know, it behaved really, really nice. I mean, from a stiffness standpoint, there wasn't a sharp drop in stiffness and it just worked really, really well. Yeah. Ryan, I don't know if you have, or, or, or Ryan, if you have any comments on, do you see anything now or thought any more about the fabrication side of using the bolt to bottom flange? But no, I think it's, it's, you know, it reminds me of doing those railroad girders where you sometimes get those. If you have a CNC machine, you just lay it all out and you drill them, modern equipment. It's very easy to make. I think Randy's had a similar comment. Yeah. I think it complements the existing gaps, guys. I think it would be a nice solution. Yeah, no, I, it's going to be nice. Uh, I, think, I, think, I think it's a, a nice solution. And, and a lot of people had good ideas. Well, this is from a research perspective. Get a bunch of people in the room, but off of that, come up with ideas. And so, Carl, you were going to make. Yeah, I, I think those connection plates are fill welded. Okay. Yeah, uh, fill welded and one sided fill welded. Okay. So I don't. Desktop's not excited necessarily about doing that, but I love the opinion it's a box. I just don't think you're going to have a corrosion issue from the inside with something kind of this. But yeah, one side of fill weld, they behave really well. So I, I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't even fill weld. If you wanted to do two sides, do two sides, that's fine. But I, you don't have to, I don't think. But anyway, um, but, yeah. Tom, is there any thought that instead of the PT just bolting up angles in the corners, even though it's not, I don't think, I don't think. Uh, Ralph Connor tested anything like that where you actually were trying to bridge with bolt up on so it would be web and flange as a way of yeah we, we, we talked, talked for a while about actually we were even starting, starting we were looking at like angles for like design concept B instead of having a welded bottom plate but I think like as far as like the PT bar the, the I mean you know we're doing PT bars which are ultra high strength relative to an angle plate and, and we're still, still needing a lot more area. I, I, I just don't think you're going to be able to put enough in that corner to make it work. And then you've got issues. The other issues are going to be, it has to be something that's providing uh, continuity all along the length. It'd be hard and like as a retrofitting procedure to be able to get in and do something like that in an existing box where you a diaphragm and diaphragm. Whereas the PT bars, you could take an annular cutter and drill a hole and thread the things through there and you could actually retrofit it. It's, it's not, not going to be easy, easy but you know, you can save tons of money. You can get these things off the fracture critical list. Man, the saving long term would be huge. But, but did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, you did. Yeah. Uh, okay. comment on that. We, we did full scale tests with connection mm -hmm. tables on spectral members, um, but not on, not on a box specifically. Like, so you'd only have an angle on one side of the web. But we did, we did full scale. Sorry, we did parametric studies looking at a box section. So, kind of looked at it, but not specific. Yeah, to me, it's that question. I mean, it's the question, right? We, we're always using built up for the strategy that Todd's talking about. But have we ever done a, uh, you know, where we were retrofitting a welded, like, so let's say an eye section where you had a welded eye and then you bolt it up? Does that do enough to? <laughs> stop the crack from propagating it's really that question right well you know, you know one of the things in the bodies here i'd like it and and um you know we've, we've got, got that free rotor option, option right that was done in connecticut and, and we have a problem statement and so we need to do this academic please plug your ears which was my <laughs> i'm hoping it goes forward and stuff like that one of the things we were looking at on that um <clears throat> I don't want to stop. I think that it, 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 it's a neat tech. Technologically, I think it's a great thing. I think it's kind of ugly. To be honest, it doesn't look that great. But one of the things we were kind of looking at, and the reason I tell you is a lot of shadows and you're seeing a lot of stuff on there, but it's doing a similar option to that. But on your outside, two girders taking the webs and moving them out. So it's almost your outside two webs, it's almost like a channel shape. It doesn't have to go to the extreme to a channel. But it would almost, so it actually, from the outside appearance, it's three girders that looks more like a box. Which I think is aesthetically a lot better. But even yeah, practically, by doing that, you're going to increase the cell for people to be inside from a closed space standpoint. I just think practically it would be a lot. I don't know if you see a problem. Maybe the handling would be diff more difficult in the, in the fast shop. I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know. That would be, I don't see any particular reason. You know, I'm trying to think about the fixture we use to fit flanges to webs. I, I think it would, I don't, off the cuff, I don't see any reason why it would be. Challenge. I don't know anyway, what you guys, you 
Yeah. And Randy, I don't know if you have any. I saw Randy here somewhere, but I didn't see him now. For us, let's get into that for the shop. The three bolted girders. For us, we would prefer it the shop as to, you know, fit the webs, the flanges, and doing all that welding, getting inside the box, turning it multiple times, and massive change. And stuff. But what about offsetting the flange? Instead of putting the web in the middle of the flange on a girder, just mm -hmm. putting it off towards one edge. Do you have any problem with that? Mm -hmm. I think you're talking about to do right. That's yeah, and if we were trying to look, look at ways to kind of improve both the aesthetics, but I even think there's just a practical improvement to it. But yeah. anyway, because we're starting to have those, those in Texas here, here, and it's like, man, if we're getting a ton of it, it'd be nice to look at the details. I, I think it'd be nice to actually do, but it's uh, you gotta watch out the sink rate of that channel. There now, you wouldn't look at it. Yeah. You have to do something on, on that, but I do think you'd be a lot better. And by the way, I, I don't think you have to take it all the way to the extreme of the channel, but you know, it's like the, the sub, like one of the things where it's, you know, moving the flanges inwards, you have more room for the top lateral trusses. It's a similar concept. You have to think about how you're picking them up and stuff like that. Yeah, you could put on the diagram post. Yeah. I think the hardest thing is the way yeah, I never did. That. It would look a lot better. No, I think it would. And, and the thing you could actually fabricate those outside two laying down. And then it's, you could actually put the verticals or whatever, something to put them together. I think there's a lot of things you could do. That. I know I've done like, wait, we're going to wait. Yeah. Yeah. But you have options there. Keep the top flange yeah. at the center. Of the, at the bottom, you can have the bottom Or also have both flanges. So a lot of neat things I think to look at. I, I'd like to look at geomet geometrically if you can't get something, and you're still using the three webs. It's still looking on fracture critical because you got three girders. But anyway, I'm just going to add we're fabricating the South Capital Expressway 45. Uh, oh, that, yeah, that's one. Yeah. yeah, we're detailing it now, and so we'll have a lot better answer for you. It's obviously just this meeting next year, but. I think they're going to start. I mean, and the nice thing about what we've got here now with the box sessions is there's an option there. You get the option of the three girder. I, I think there's going to be a lot more option for these straddle caps. And then non fracture critical can be huge from an overall maintenance perspective. Yeah. And the, the items we price up, you know, in the different studies that we did partnered with you guys, they, I mean, they were both good to not. <laughs> yeah. I was talking about as well. Yeah, y'all did a really like, great job. It really is. Yeah. It's, 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 it's kind of I didn't recognize Jason was on the individuals, by the way, that was instrumental in Purdue and coming up with the design, and not the design, the testing approach that we're doing. I just didn't see when I looked over there. I need to get here two minutes earlier and look at the room or whatever before we start talking. So, anyway. There's an online question for Dr. Um, Elwig. Uh, it's for the first project we were talking about. How many specimens were tested using each protocol, and uh, was there any, was there a lot of uh, variability in the results between the protocols? Yeah, so what we ended up doing in this is we, we tested um, with a baseline specimen, which actually was the upside down specimen with the, with the Dow Dag bars. And we pushed it where the crack went. I want to say it went, it went past the halfway, but we didn't want to take it all the way because we had to essentially put it back on and fix it and so on. But essentially, we're just doing one test on each design uh, on design concept A. We did two different design concepts B, but got very similar behavior and, and excellent behavior on it. As I said, even on design concept A, it, it, it did arrest the crack. So, like, you know, we load up, we dynamically loaded it, it cracked, but it did arrest the crack and there was hardly any deflection. But when we loaded it back up, as I said, the crack went. But it, I think that was just the case we, we need more PT bars. And then we'll be able to tell that, I think, you know, analytically as we're doing our parametric studies and so on. But um, yeah, these weren't cheap tests. <laughs> and actually, to do each test, you know, it's like you're talking several months of taking out, getting it set up, getting it in there, and doing it. The tests actually only take, you know, the, the fracture tests take a half hour to get the things cooled down. And they're done in, in 10 seconds or whatever. So, anyway. Okay. So have you ever considered a load transfer history? You know, when we do the 
uh, when we do not even unintentionally, not really the share carried by the start of the moment. Yeah, the share force. But the threshold state, especially for the overall harm of the bridge, we do consider some appropriate thing. So that's the way we need to think of that. Um, in that, then when we look the low, we need to be carried by the share stars. What's the source of the load that's transverse? Because you know what happens on the composite longitudinally is you're developing the composite strength of the slab. So it's a huge force. But I don't know what the moment the moment is written, right? This is regularly not this is not the whole thing. But transversely, we need to consider the wind force here. When we hit the reading, when the wind force hit the reading, then the force will transfer to the slab and the tissue. But I think the forces are tiny, relatively speaking. You know, because it's, you know, when you start looking at what you're generating in the composite strength of the girder, I mean, it's thousands of chips. I mean, it's huge. Laterally from wind, I, I just don't think you're going to have anything that would cause any issues there whatsoever. But you could predict it more like a force per, per foot and see what the slab, I, I think that you're going to get more than enough. It's not going to be an issue there. 